Welcome to Confessions of a Vet Nurse. My name is Tess and this is my brand new podcast. I'm pretty excited to start this. I've kind of been toying with the idea like off and on for a little while. I'll probably start doing like video podcasting but for now I'm just going to do audio just because I've started listening to podcasts on my way to work and I'm like this is great like this is so cool so I want to do it because I have lots of stuff to ramble about specifically in the veterinary world so if you're fresh to vet nursing you've been nursing for four years 10 years 20 years um, this is kind of going to be all relevant to you I like to keep the vet industry light-hearted I like to keep it funny I don't like to kind of dive into anything too negative because the reason that we got into this job is because we love animals and that is the highlight. That's what we need to highlight and that's what we need to focus on to make sure that we enjoy this job long term. So basically, though, this podcast is going to be kind of talking about like behind the scenes, funny stuff, you know, career growth, all the kind of stuff that I find interesting. So I think you'll find it interesting. For anyone who's been kind of watching, following me for a little while, I've been doing social media for a few years now and, you know, kind of posting videos, TikToks. TikToks is where I kind of took off. But I have been a vet nurse for 10 years. I started vet nursing straight out of high school. Um, I did work experience when I was about 15 in a pet store for a week. That was like part of our high school kind of curriculum that you've got to do like a week in your kind of chosen career path when you leave school. I knew I always wanted to work with animals. Um, so I chose a pet shop to start off with. That was pretty kind of weird. I might tell some stories about that later on. I might write that down because that's actually really funny. So I did my work experience in a pet store. And then I finished high school, but like in the last kind of six months of high school, I was like, okay, I'm going to finish up high school and I've got no job to go to. I'm probably not going to go to uni, but I want to do vet nursing. I wanted to go to uni because I wanted to become a vet, but I tried to do physics and chemistry in school and I just could not physically comprehend it. So I was like, okay, that's probably a little bit out of my reach, which is totally fine. So I was like, okay, being a vet, a veterinarian for me is probably not on the cards, but let's look at what else there is. It's veterinary nurse. Okay, let's do that. So I studied like all random subjects in school, but I would always, if you were following this path, always study biology because I feel like there's a lot of stuff that you can do in that in that class that helps towards what you're going to do in vet nursing. Um, biology, if your school offers like horticulture, that might be cool as well, but I did like English, math, biology, film and TV, home ec, and oh, what else did I do? I did like dance, fashion, all of the like fun subjects, really. My school had so many different kind of subjects that you could do, which was cool. Um, but so where was I? I lost, I went, I did my work experience and then I kept going. And then it got to the last six months of year 12. And so I was like, okay, let's try and sort this out. So when I leave school, I finish up. I'm not just like working my net normal like after school job. So I got in my little car. I had a little beetle at the moment at the time and I filled up the passenger seat with resumes and I highlighted on there that I had been doing, um, you know, I'd worked in, I'd done work experience in the pet store. I had always, I should have mentioned this as, as well, whilst I was in year 11 and 12, I did a 18 month course called a certificate three in companion animals. I don't know what it's called these days. I could probably figure it out for you. Um, but that was kind of like the leader course that you do before you go into vet nursing. Well, it was back then. So I had, you know, that all written down on my resume. So it looked good. I'd worked with animals. Um, and that's kind of what clinics look for. So I drove around to all these clinics on like the, like the end of the Gold Coast that I was on. At, I was at at the time I was still living with my parents. And I dropped my resume into probably like 10 different vet clinics. And the last clinic that I dropped my resume off to was the clinic that was like, yeah, great. Do you want to come in next week? And I offered, I didn't ask for a job straight away. I just offered to do some work experience. And I feel like that is the key to kind of getting your foot in the door because vet clinics are, they always need help. They're always understaffed, but they are kind of always looking for qualified staff because they are time poor it's hard just kind of hiring someone off the bat that's got no kind of work experience from a vet clinic. So I was like, okay, can I have some work experience? Um, see how I go. If this is kind of right for me and it's right for you, then we'll kind of go from there. So what I did for the next six months was in that last year, year 12, 
I did a day a week for six months, um, just work experience. And it was all teed up with the school as well. Like if you want to set something like this up, I think I just went to my guidance counselor and they were all sweet with it. Um, and it kind of took place for when I was doing, when I was doing that course, that Cert 3 and Companion Animals, it, that was a day of the week. So this just kind of carried on from then. Uh, I went to, I did my six months. I was like, I love this. This was really cool. It got to the end. I was about to finish school. I said, I went to the clinic owner. I was like, hey, like, I love this. I really want to study vet nursing. Would you be willing to take me on full time, you know, part time casual for placement whilst I do the course? I studied with Australian College of Vet Nursing. Uh, so it was all online. Like I never went to any classrooms. I never kind of spoke to anyone on the phone. It was all online. So it was really good. So it worked out for me. So they send you out these huge textbooks, um, all these workbooks, they post it all out to you. And so that was in like December that I finished up school. You know, I went to schoolies, I had a bit of a break. And then in January, I started my job at the vet clinic and started my course. So I was still doing like a day a week there. And then I was still working like after school jobs. At the time, I think I was working like three jobs. I worked at Boost Juice, I worked at Sunglass Hut, and I was working at this vet clinic. Um, so it was cool. I was busy and I had like lots to do and it was great. Like I was thriving. And then it probably got to like six months down the track. I was doing really well in the clinic. It was kind of like a one vet, one nurse, and then me. Uh, so I could learn a lot. Like it wasn't like it was, you know, too crowded or too busy that, I wasn't learning and I was really interested as well. So I would go home and I would look up stuff that, you know, they'd been talking about during the day or, and I'd ask lots of questions. Um, so it got to about six months in and they kind of, we were picking up, it was getting really busy. So I went to a few more days a week and that kind of just kept building. So then I was working like full time at the vet clinic and then I was studying like one day a week. And I would spend, because it is still like a lot of study that you need to do, don't get me wrong. Um, I would spend on my one day that I would study, I would wake up at like 7am and I would work from 7 till like 12 o'clock at night, just smashing out like heavy hours of this work. And I felt like for me, that was like the best way for me to kind of get through the study, just like smashing it like power hours kind of thing. And it worked. Um, so I did that. And then I, it, because I was working so much and I, you know, working in a clinic, they're long days. And, you know, we, at the time when we were still building, building the clinic, we do lots of after hours surgery. So like I would always be there, you know, after hours, like they were long, long days. So it's not like you would go home and study afterwards. Like I just physically was like exhausted and everything was so new to me and, you know, still learning. So it's a bit like overwhelming to start off with. So I ended up, the course that I had signed up for was about two years long. Um, I ended up extending it so much. Like I would just keep asking for extensions after extensions and I would have to pay every time I would ask for extensions. So it's, you know, your own, it was my own fault. And I ended up extending it. I think the course ended up taking me about three years, maybe a little bit over, which was fine. You know, I don't think we should be kind of rushing the courses and just kind of getting a tick just to say that you know something when you don't like I think that these courses probably do need to be about three to four years I know that kind of like TAFE Queensland and stuff they were doing a one-year vet nursing course which to me I just go wow like I just feel like that is not enough time for you to kind of absorb all this information that you need to know you know you kind of thrown through this course and you don't get time to kind of absorb everything so I think that if you're doing these courses, I would always kind of pick a longer one. I know that that, you know, you might want to smash it out, but just for your own benefit, I think always go for a little bit longer. Uh, I worked in the clinic. I was just nursing for years. I loved it. I had a little bit of a um, midlife crisis kind of thing a few years in. I don't know what kicked it off, but I was like, I want to go and study dentistry. And I love teeth. Like I literally love teeth. And my boss said to me, look, we don't really see you doing anything other than working in the vet industry. And I was like, yeah, like, you're probably right. Like, I love this. I love animals. Like, I love working with animals. I love vet clinics as a whole. Like, I feel like in a vet clinic, I can walk into any vet clinic and I just love the environment. It's so weird. 
but so I stayed I just kept doing it and then I was plotting them along and I think it was a year later I got offered a practice management role so I did practice management for about three or four years um I was in this one clinic for 10 years and then I took long service leave and now I'm in a totally different role which I'll go into in another episode but I just wanted to kind of talk to you about like where my kind of journey into vet nursing and a couple of things that I also wanted to mention that I do get a lot of messages about from people is you know I can't find a job in a vet clinic um the struggles of you know I don't know if vet nursing is going to be for me I don't know if I can handle you know blood and seeing animals in pain and things like that and for anyone that's been in vet nursing for a little while you guys would know that this you know those kind of things we kind of adapt to and it's definitely not as bad as what you kind of think not not as bad but you get you don't get used to it either but you kind of adapt and you kind of understand the reasons why all of these things happen like yes an animal might come in in pain but we're there to help them like that's why we need to be there to help them lots of people think that they're going to be really confronted by like seeing blood and guts and all that kind of stuff with like an open surgery but you'd be surprised at how like you dissociate it from like humans it's kind of like for me i can't look at any kind of you know human surgery blood I can't even get injections or anything like that I'll faint like I feel sick you know thinking about a needle going into me I'll get Botox but like that's different (laughs) but um for for animals I feel like it's different it's like they don't um I don't know it's really strange but I definitely think that you know if you are cautious about that do some working experience in a clinic you know do some you know you're not there's no pressure there you go in and you figure out if you like it or not that's all you need to do and then if you go in and you go oh my god I actually handle it really well and I love it then you know you know you're not going to just kind of go by just thinking oh I should have done it or I shouldn't have done it or blah da da but you go in there and you go and then you might go oh like it's really not for me like it's really like okay I'm happy that I did this because it's told me I'm not going to, you know, waste all this study and, you know, get into something that I don't feel comfortable with. That's totally fine as well. But I think, you know, probably 80% of the time people kind of get in and then they go, oh, no, I love this. Like, this is for me. And that's exactly what you need to do. I would definitely always do kind of go into like looking at doing work experience if you are interested in doing work in the vet industry. Another thing that I wanted to talk about as well is that those first kind of couple of years of vet nursing oh my god my my voice just totally dropped um the, those first couple of years of vet nursing can be really hard like it can be really hard I and you kind of put so much pressure on yourself that you should know all of this stuff you know I remember you know working with a older nurse my like mentor the best person you've ever met in your whole life, entire life. Like to this day, I still say to myself, what would she do? What would Lisa do? And I will, you know, I'll always kind of replicate things that and how she behaved and how she was with animals and how she taught people and how she kind of spoke to people. It's just a total role, role model for me. And I was so lucky to find someone to teach me like that. Um, And she was you know she had so much knowledge and I would you know I was a a year into you know just studying to be a vet nurse but you kind of when you're studying and you're doing your placement you're kind of working in a clinic as a vet nurse you know you're work you're not you're doing anesthetics you're doing all that stuff but you know you obviously they don't throw you in you've got some training up to it but it is your responsibility as well to kind of balance what they can teach you whilst you're on your placement days with what you're the study that you're doing at home like if you're going in and you're just solely relying on the people in the clinic to teach you that's not their sole job you know their job is to look after the patients as well they can't be focusing on training you as such as you know some clinics might be they might have a dedicated trainer which is amazing and you are so spoiled if you get that take advantage of that Um, But you need to also be putting in the work in your own, you know, the technical, the theory of it all, like going home and actually studying and going, okay, we did this today. Let me go home and like, look it up. Let me search it. Let me look at my textbook. I want to educate myself more on certain subjects. You can't kind of not be willing to put in that 50-50 balance. So I think that as long as you are dedicated to it, it is a lot easier for you. But I remember, yeah, I remember with this, 
with my a mentor that she was so smart and so knowledgeable. She knew so much. She'd been doing it for 10 years when I started. And, you know, you kind of, I would kind of beat myself up and be like, oh, like, I should know this. I'm really embarrassed. Like, I feel embarrassed that I don't know the answer to this. And I'm like, I've just literally started. I've just opened my textbook this year. Like, you get this kind of sense of, and what, it, it's, it's actually called imposter syndrome. And if you're jumping into the vet industry, you will hear this term kind of thrown around a lot. Imposter syndrome is when you feel like, you are like a con artist kind of thing like you should know all of this stuff and people just kind of people are looking at you as if you're like a qualified nurse but you're not but you should be this kind of whole this whole thing that is so irrelevant like it's so and it's bad because even me you know I'd be nursing for 10 years I would still get certain kind of imposter syndrome about some aspects of vet nursing and like it's silly and it just kind of tampers with your confidence and it can kind of rattle you especially in those kind of two years those first two years so I think that just being aware of it is going to help you so much like so much so go and look up imposter syndrome I've actually done a I've got a guide on vet nurse school that talks about imposter syndrome, how to avoid it, how to kind of like see it before it kind of affects you more than anything. Because mental health in the veterinary industry is a big thing. You need to be aware before you kind of go into it because some of this stuff, you know, it hits you hard. Like it does hit your like emotions. You know, you're dealing with animals that are, you know, we are saying goodbye to some animals some days. But in retrospect, like I always say to people, you know, it's, 90% of the time it's a great time you know there's puppies there's healthy dogs you know lots of this time that puppy dogs are coming in for consults cats coming it's for a good thing you know they're coming in for a vaccine don't think that going to work in a vet clinic that every single appointment is going to be doom and gloom it's not like that you know and to put it into perspective you're probably doing your clinic would see you know say 60 patients a day one of them might be a euthanasia that kind of puts it into perspective perspective that it's <laughs> that it isn't all negative so don't let people kind of go oh i could never do that job it's so horrible it's so sad just you know just back it up a minute because it's not always like that a couple of things that like i would suggest around getting around like imposter syndrome and kind of when people when you're fresh into a clinic you kind of expect you're expected to kind of know the you know the general ropes and you are still learning but I would always kind of suggest that you ask as many questions as you possibly can you know write down any questions that you've got if you're not sure about something don't don't ever like feel silly or stupid for asking for help because I understand like in different industries it might be different like hey um what's a good example like um say you're working in a fruit shop and you're asking oh is that an orange or is that a mandarin I don't know kind of I'm gonna ask someone someone you might think oh you should probably know that you know like you're a fully grown adult and it's fruit or something 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 similar to that it's a little bit different and a little bit more serious when it comes to animals so say you're working in a vet clinic and you're about to pre-med a dog prior to a surgery. So when I say pre-med a dog prior to a surgery, so when a dog has a general anesthetic, so they're fully knocked out during a surgery, they need a pre-medication that's given, you know, an hour or so before they're actually anesthetized with a different medication for that surgery. So the pre-med is the first kind of medication that they're going to get at the start of the day, it makes them a little bit, it's usually mixed with an opioid and it's usually mixed with a sedative. And so it kind of kicks in a little bit of pain relief prior to surgery and it gives them a sedative that kind of makes them all chill. Say you've been instructed, hey, can you give that dog a pre-med? And you aren't sure which two medications are to go in that pre-med. That is not something that you just kind of guess. That is always gonna be something that you need to kind of clarify. And don't feel silly for asking because if you just go ahead and just kind of give two medications that were wrong, then it's kind of critical. Do you know what I mean? So you're always, you know, these kind of things need to be asked. And that's not a stupid question. You know, that's not something that every Joe Blow knows, you know, 
these medications, they get confusing. They get, you know, they're all over the shop. Pharmacology is really, really hard to kind of wrap your head around. And um, there's lots of little techniques and guides and stuff that you can use to help you with that. But until you've been doing it for like, you know, five plus years, you're going to get names of medications wrong. You're going to, you know, want to ask because with medications, what happens is they've got a, um, like an ing an active ingredient, right? So that's the actual active ingredient that's the medication. But then the medication is going to have, you know, it gets made by different brands and then it's going to have different brand, you know, different kind of label names so that it gets so confusing. So do not ever feel silly for asking that kind of question. Say if you ask that question, hey, I'm just not sure about this pre-med, instead of saying, hey, um, what pre-med do you want? It's about how you ask as well that also kind of comes off. It might make you feel a little bit better about asking as well. So say, I want to know about this pre-med. I would say, instead of going, hey, what's the pre-med? Or something, you know, blunt kind of like that. Instead, I was going, to, I would say, and it, this kind of backs up, you just want to do the right thing by the pair. I would say, hey, I just want to double check this with you. I was going to give, um, you know, methadone and acepromazine and just checking that's that's right. And that nurse will go, oh, no, we're going to do, you know, um, butorphanol, acepromazine or something, something. I'm, not, I'm, I'm just throwing out words at the moment. Um, and they'll be like, then that's the point that they can show you, oh, actually, we're going to do this. And you go, oh, great. OK, cool. Lucky I, I'm happy that I asked. And then you get this sense of relief that you asked the question. You know, instead of later on someone going, hey, this dog isn't quite sedate or, you know, it's had a reaction or something that it's the wrong medication. You've asked that question and you you've done the right thing, not only by you so you don't feel guilty and kicking yourself later. You've done the right thing by that pet. And at the end of the day, I don't care about like anyone. I don't care about if I look stupid. I don't care about if, you know, if, you know, people think I'm stupid for asking questions. At the end of the day, by asking questions, all you're doing is showing how much you care for your patients. Like that, that is the crux of it all. It's not just, you know, you're going to wing something, give a medication that's the wrong medication. And, you know, it might be detrimental to that patient. You, everything that you do working as a vet nurse needs to be at the advocacy of the pet. So just focus on what's in the best interest of the pet. And that is all you can do. That is why you got into this job. That is why... Like, I love this job. That is why you're perfect for this job. And don't ever feel stupid for asking questions. That's the, you know, the long end of that story is ask more questions. Don't feel silly for asking questions. You're doing the right thing by asking questions. And that's going to help you a lot in those first kind of two detrimental years of your nursing. Another thing that happens in those two years is, and I've seen this quite a lot, and I, I experienced this, I definitely did. And I only realized it when I saw it written somewhere recently, like I saw it written on TikTok or somewhere, or I got a message about it and was like, hey, I'm experienced the two year blues. And I was like, oh my god like I had that like I had that and it was when you kind of in the first kind of 80 months or so and this might affect someone in like you know their third year or whatnot but in the first kind of two years of probably 18 months I was you know on the on top of the moon I was like oh my god I love this I'm working with animals every day like I felt really good da, 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 da. and then it got a little bit later down the track and this might happen in reverse for some people as well but it got to about two years in and I everything just kind of started to hit me like a lot harder and I think that this was a probably my imposter syndrome kind of really settling in and I was like oh my god am I helping like am I doing the right thing and it was that like every day not every day but like lots of the cases that we would have come in they really rattled me, you know, like they really, I would go home crying in the car. I'll never forget a couple actually. And first one was that a dog, um, a dog had run out of like the driveway and the friend had hit the dog and this man raced his dog down. It was a like he raced the dog down to the clinic and he came running in with it and threw it on like, you know, put it on the surgery table and we're trying to look at it, work on it. And one of the vets came in and checked for a heartbeat and, you know, the dog had passed away. Like it had been hit and the dog was gone. And 
that was so that was so sad like that was so devastating and I think what was the hardest part about it is that the shock it's not even so much like obviously that's horrific for that dog that poor thing what would get to me the most was the the owner's reactions like this man I'll never forget he walked outside and like he was you know he was gutted you know absolutely gutted and it was the fact that the owner had to go through that that upset me more than anything like I was devastated for this man I, and all I could think of was imagine if you know that happened to me that that ha if that was my dog I would be I'd, I would be a mess I remember crying on the way home from that and then another one was that a dog had drowned in the pool and the owners had come home and found the dog drowned in the pool and I like and the dog was like six months old like that it was devastating and I, I I remember getting in the car and just crying and the dog hadn't even you know come down to the clinic like they just called to tell us and I just remember being like oh my god those poor people like they've gone home and their poor dog like that was the, the whole like that part of the compassion fatigue really hit me that it was you hear all these stories about these people going through this and how awful that must be and that was with that that was the bit that kind of would always made me would always get to me and like another one was like uh middle-aged men like did dads if they ever brought a dog in and you know had to say goodbye to the family pet or something like that and a dad would be in tears that would always get to me because like you know you never like I know men do cry I know that that's a whole thing but you know you, it's very rare that you see a, a f fully grown man cry and all I would do is I would relate that to my dad I would think of my dad straight away and I would be like oh my god like if my dad went through this I would be absolutely devastated and actually he did that was the first and only time I think I've ever seen my dad cry was when he had to take our staffy to the vet um sparky when I was like I might have been like 10 and they took the dog to the vet and he they didn't bring him home and he had like a big he had testicular cancer and um he was a rescue and we dissected him when we got him um but it had kind of grown and like spread and metastasized and it was really sad and I remember my dad coming home and my dad standing in the kitchen with his sunglasses on and um he him just saying oh yeah he's gone and tears running down his face and I will never forget that and so I relate that when grown men would come into the clinic with their family family dog that you know they loved and they were close with and um god that used to get me I used to be so sad about that um oh there was another one I was gonna say another one was this um I remember this little dog and it was a young girl well she wasn't young she was like a uni student but she was fresh into uni and she was studying like um some kind of medical degree I'm pretty sure she the dog had all of these issues and the dog was really young and they made the decision to put the dog down and you know this dog was so like it was really sad the dog you know would have had no quality of life it was just this freak kind of compilation of medical issues that this dog had and um I remember when they said goodbye to this dog and it was she was in hysterics like she was so and that was like a oh god like it really got to me it was awful 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 but in saying this I remember these because it, I was fresh to it you know I hadn't really experienced these kind of incidences before you know just being in high school and plotting along just thinking I'm um, you know something else and then you get into this and this is when you kind of experience like life experience like this is life you know this is what happens in life shit like this happens out there and it was just all kind of like a big hit in the face to me I was like oh my god like this sucks like this is hard but it got better, you know, like it wasn't that I didn't get so affected by it. I just kind of grew with it that, you know, there's reasons why we do what we do and we're here to help. And of course, we're going to hear about them. We're working in a vet clinic. We're going to hear most about these things. But don't kind of think that this is, you know, all doom and gloom, that this happens, you know, every single day, all day you know, it's, it's rare, but of course we're going to hear about them, but just don't let them weigh you down for too long. And so I went, these kind of happened and I was kind of like, oh, I don't know, like, is this is for me. And I kept plodding along 
and eventually a few years later down the track I kind of found my feet and nothing kind of affected me like it used to and as hard as it is and probably you know I feel kind of like heartless in like the last few probably five years or so nothing kind of would upset me and nothing kind of I had no kind of emotional you know bond to, obviously some of them I definitely did you know it, it's hard not to but I was just I got better at managing it and it was so more so that I wouldn't keep going home and stewing on stuff which I think is really important and so it was kind of like to me I'd kind of broken free of that kind of I feel I feel guilty I feel you know this fatigue this you know emotional kind of roller coaster and so from then was when I really stood into you know I felt like I became the best nurse that I could possibly be it was because I could think in like a dramatic you know in an emergency situation I could think you know what can we do what you know solution you know I was like a problem a problem maker <laughs> a um problem solver and I felt like that was when I really kind of stood up and kind of st stood out in the clinic and kind of powered through and that was when that were they were my best years you know so you've got to go through some tough years to get to those really really good years um and because I wasn't so I could yeah I could definitely kind of work around different situations I could think more than be upset or affected by them which for this kind of industry is so important like you need people like that around you know you you meet these really well like seasoned nurses that have been doing it forever and they are so valuable to vet clinics because it's hard like it is hard and that's the thing you know you do hear about these nurses they do it for a few years and then they leave and then they haven't kind of got to that full potential amazing vet nurse that they could have been when and it's hard like and it is unfair but it is a hard industry um but it is worth it what i'm trying to say is those years it is hard it's tough if you motor through and you're trying to, you know, you stay positive, you keep your hobbies on the weekend, you kind of hang out with your friends, you, you know, you get out there, you don't just dwell at home all the time thinking about what happened at work this week, you will kind of come out the other side. And that is when you start to really, like, really enjoy your job. So that's kind of the basis of where I kind of started from and where I have kind of got to. So I did 10 years at this clinic. I loved it. I love vet nursing. Um, and now I'm just kind of chilling, but I'll go into more of that in kind of the next podcast, but I'd love to just do kind of like a Q and a podcast just to kind of, you know, get us rolling. So if you have comments, put them in here, send them to me on Instagram or on YouTube or wherever you want to put them. I don't even know like where, you know, there's so many different platforms these days, but I'm across all of them. I'm scattered. You guys see me. Um, but let me know what you want to see. And thank you for listening to me ramble if you have listened so far. Um, I will talk to you guys soon. Bye.